Good morning. Good to see you. Good to have you with us online. If you can't be here in the big room, great to have you with us as well. Raise your hand if you have ever been on a cruise ship or a battleship or toured a battleship or a, you know, destroyer or anything like that. Okay, all right, so just about everybody. They're massive, aren't they? They're huge. One of the biggest problems that the U.S. had when we were in World War II was getting our troops to the front lines. We had trouble getting all of our troops over to Germany, over to the Pacific Islands, to Africa, even where we fought there. And we had, we had issues. See, the world was a lot bigger then. You couldn't just fly them over real easy at that point. We had to have troop transports, and we were trying to build them at this huge, constant pace just to get troop carriers to rush our troops to the front line. Even as the war was winding down, production continued because the world around us still looked like it could be poised for more trouble, for more fighting. So this was the next generation warship that we came up with. This is the SS United States. It was commissioned in the late 1940s. One of the most fastest, advanced, elite class of ships to ever grace our, our waters. There's just one problem with it. Not only did it not see battle, it never carried a single troop. Not one. Not a single troop. So what happened was over the next few years, it was slowly converted from this advanced, fast troop carrier to an opulent, sluggish luxury liner. And VIPs used it, and foreign dignitaries, and the hoity-toity class. Those who like the comfortable chairs, you know what I mean? Even the president used it. It's just one problem. It's not what it was for. It wasn't meant to be that. See, as a troop carrier, what it was designed to be, it could transport over 15,000 troops. But when it was converted to a luxury liner, it could hold less than 2,000 troops. Less than 2,000 people, period. You know why? Because they were interested in their comfort. They were interested in making them feel good. So they had these amenities. They put in swimming pools in the cruise ship. They put in big staterooms where you could sleep and have overlooked balconies and spas and all these great things and theaters on there. It's just one problem. That's not what the ship was built to do. And it wanted to stretch its legs so bad. It wanted to, to go and do what it was created to do, which is take troops from training to battle. See, here's the thing. When you have a luxury liner, the luxury liner, if they did their job right, those people didn't want to leave the boat. They wanted to stay on the boat, right? If they did their job right, they would want to be there and hurry up and come back and spend more money. But troop care was just the opposite. They wanted to be uncomfortable enough that they would go, all I'm taking you is from training to the battle. All I'm taking you is to the front lines. And I read this story here in David Platt's book, Radical. Many of you read this as well. And after he shared this story, he wrote this couple sentences. It was so profound. He said this. The church, like the SS United States, has been designed for battle. The purpose of the church is to mobilize a people to accomplish a mission. Mm, I like that. But what I didn't like was his next comment. His next comment, he had to look for it, said this. We seem to have turned the church as a troop carrier into the church as a luxury liner. We seem to have organized ourselves to be inward focused, not to engage the battle for the souls of the people around us in the world, but to indulge ourselves in the peaceful comforts of the world. Ow. Ow. So we've been studying the mission of the church. And what does it mean to, to be a great commission church? What does it mean to be a church that is a sending church, not a sitting church? And as I look at this, this is a great question. What about us? Do we want to be a luxury liner? Or do we want to be a troop carrier that's ready for battle? Because if you choose to be a troop carrier, be ready. The battle is coming. See, the reality is for a lot of us, if, if you're a son or daughter of the king, if you know the Lord Jesus, here's the breaking news. You're already in a battle. <laughs> the enemy knows you. At least he's supposed to. He's supposed to know who you are. He's supposed to be, if, if you are walking through life clear sailing with no opposition to you, you need to check which way you are walking. 
if the devil is leaving you alone, if there is no spiritual opposition coming against you, then I dare say maybe he's letting you, don't mess with that one. That one's blinded and distracted and going this way. Worry about those that are advancing the kingdom of Jesus. See, that's how the enemy thinks. We look at the tragic truth is many of the soldiers in this battle haven't even left the barracks. Some are comfortable in their snug in their wee little beds, right? They just they forget putting on their armor or how to draw their sword. They're content to stay in the mess hall. But what if I told you the good news is God didn't call you into the battle. He didn't put you in the family and leave you as an orphan naked on the battlefield. He gives you every tool you need in his incredible spiritual arsenal. See, see, the enemy likes to divide us, likes to distract us, to think we're going against humans, against people who are different than us, right? But that's not the enemy. And Paul comes along, and he is talking in Ephesians, guys, there is a spiritual battle, and you need to go in with your eyes wide open. You need to be looking for this. And he comes, and he gives us a self-defense master class right here in Ephesians 6. So if you're ready, open your Bible. Ephesians 6, we're going to look at the New King James Version today. Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 10 through verse 17. All right, New King James Version says this. <clears throat> Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, against humans, right? But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And then take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. See, something very interesting happens here. Did you notice there is a word that jumps out repeatedly? I'll give you a hint. It's in verse 12, and it might go on into verse 13. There's a word that Paul uses six times. Did you catch it? The word is against. Against the wiles of the devil. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities, against powers, against demonic forces in the higher spiritual wickedness, the heavenly places. Every single time Paul mentions another class of spiritual enemies, he reaffirms that you have to stand against them. So you know I got to ask, how are you doing with that? How are you standing in the battle? Do you feel any spiritual tension around you when you take a stand for Christ? This cannot be emphasized enough. Look at this. Sometimes it seems like it is other humans that we are against. That is not the gospel. Sometimes it seems like there's humans who are attacking us. I mean, we look at Jesus and we see these humans who nailed him to the cross and we get mad at him and say, how could you do that? Do you not know who you're doing this dude? This is the Messiah. We see these humans who murder Paul. In fact, they slaughter 11 out of 12 of the disciples. We see humans who are torturing Christians as we speak in other countries because of their faith in Christ. And we see that. And we get mad and we say, I want to take them out. Shouldn't somebody do something? Paul is saying, do not miss this, okay? Jesus is quoted in Luke 22 saying, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. Even as Jesus was suffering some of the worst torture imaginable, he recognized that his apparent human enemies weren't even fully aware what was really happening behind the scenes. They weren't the ones truly in control of the war that's waging. So Paul is saying, the enemy is not flesh and blood. You need to hear that, church. As the days grow darker, as the tension ratchets up between you and brother and sister and mother and father and daughter and son, those who stand for righteousness and those who want to go along to get along, those who want the sway of the current of the culture to dictate versus the Christ of the Bible to dictate what is right. As you see that tent, you are going to feel that current. God has given us tools that are meant for a different kind of warfare. And Paul is absolutely convinced of the spiritual battle. And he says, if you are a believer in Christ, there is no middle ground. 
You should be feeling the current against you, are you? Just do an inventory. Where you go, what you do, who you speak, who you talk to, who you stand for. The current, you will feel slowly, it should be pulling against you. Every time I think about currents, it reminds me of swimming. We have a great swimmer in our church, the great Mimi Holland. And a few years ago, I remember talking to her that if you get up ahead of steam going, there's this great picture of her swimming where she is going like Mach 7 here and just tearing it up and going and going. But she's not done with the race. Guess what happens? She hits the end of this wall and look, hippity flippity, she got to turn around and come back this way. There's just one problem about your speed. When you've built up a head of water coming at you, now it is, it is going again. The current is pulling you backwards. Did you know this is why when you do the underwater flip, a lot of times you'll see them go down and under it because that current is going again. It is pulling them. If you watch The Chosen, you see it in the credits that all these gray fish just going with the current, and then one blue fish dares to swim upstream. And it goes across, and then it's two fish that are blue. Now it's three, all the way up to the disciple. It's incredible. The current, Paul is telling us the good news is you do not have to fight these currents with your own power. So whew, breathe a sigh of relief, okay? God didn't drop you into the pool in your bathing suit and say, go fight the devil. This is not what he's done. Thankfully, we aren't left to fight these battles. And here's your first spiritual nugget. Write this down. Spiritual battles require spiritual weapons. This is so, so critical. Spiritual weapons. In the very next verse, Paul goes on to mention six different types of armor, six different pieces that we're supposed to wear. What's fascinating to me is when you think of armor, you always think of it as protective and defensive by its design, right? But look. Of the six things you see pointed out, only five of them are defensive. Did you catch that? As you look at that diagram, one of them is offensive. Can you tell which one it is? The sword, absolutely. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Look at verse 10 of Ephesians 6. I want you to point out something here. It says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil, all right? Now, I want to point out something here because it is so important, and it's actually going to get a little creepy here in a second. Be strong in who? The Lord. And in whose mighty power? His mighty power. Put on whose armor? God's. Did you catch that? This is critical. Now, I, I am very serious when I say this because I do not want somebody to get hurt. I am not talking about going out in the flesh and trying to rebuke a demonic spirit. I'm not talking about going into the enemy's quarters and in your own flesh, your own power, trying to cast out demons. I'm not talking about anything like that, okay? Because that is a very horrifying situation. In fact, we see that you all, there are scary movies made every year about people who go in and try to rebuke demonic entities and things like that, right? You all see them. There's one coming out next week. Everybody's all talking about it. There is a creepy story in Acts 19 of people who did just that. Look at it with me. It says this. Now, some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists also attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by uh, the Jesus that that guy preaches. Okay, so they don't know Jesus. They're pointing to somebody. They're borrowing authority by the Jesus that... Paul preaches. These were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest. They were doing this. The evil spirit answered, and this is so creepy, I know Jesus, and I recognize Paul, but who are you? Can you imagine being in that room and the blood draining from their face going, what's that? It didn't work? What, what just happened? But who are you? Then the man, singular, get this, who had the evil spirit, singular, jumped on them, plural, and overpowered them all and prevailed. You know what prevailed means? Uh, that's a polite way of saying they got their tails whipped. He prevailed against them so that they all ran out of the house naked and wounded. Can you imagine? So word begins to spread about this, and I love the ending of this. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high esteem. I bet it was. Do you see what just happened? Y'all, this is the stuff of nightmares. These guys come in trying to cast out evil spirits in their own strength, in their own authority, and it turned into something out of a horror movie. These demons terrifyingly attacked men with such violence that it tore their clothes to shreds, 
and sent them scurrying out of the house. Can you imagine if you were walking down the road and you hear this? What would it sound like? Are you hearing furniture, people being thrown up against the wall, or bones being broken? They prevailed against, this is one guy attacking seven grown men, and they were destroyed. They escaped with their life this time, but not much more. God has given us armor and weapons to use in battle, and every single piece is critical. As the days grow darker, you will see the forces of darkness and the demonic activity continue to stir up. You see it in schools. You see it in universities. You see things that once were so understood as right and wrong now being celebrated. And if you stand up, you are a racist, sexist, bigoted, homophobic, Islamophobic, your momophobic, you name it, they've got a title for it. And you say, contraire, I have not changed. God's word has not changed. The culture has changed. Are you willing to stand? You better put your armor on. You better draw your sword. I'm not talking about violence. I'm talking about the word of God and knowing it and standing on that. Okay, so Paul goes through and he mentions very specific pieces. Look at the first one. The first one is the belt or the girdle of truth. All right, this is our greatest defense, knowing the truth. This is how you know what false lies are, what deception is. It is hard to know a lie if you have no standard of truth. Do you understand that, right? You do not know what is crooked unless you have some delineation of what is straight. And I look around and I'm wondering, where's all the followers of Christ who know how to call a straight line a straight line? Where are the people who are sold out? Where are the people who care about standards of holiness and righteousness and truth? Jesus shows up and he's not a way. He's not pointing people to the way. He says, I am the way, the what? the truth and the life he is pointing us. And he's got this, this analogy, Paul tells us, the belt in the suit of armor, this girdle is the foundation of a soldier's armor. It holds all the other key pieces together. Without the belt of truth, everything falls apart. There is no starting point. And just like that, without knowing the truth, you will fall for anything. And we see so many good people doing that today. I can't tell you how many good Friends of mine, family members, they say, well, Pastor Matt, that doesn't, that doesn't feel good. That, does, that, that kind of offends my sensibility. Okay, God's word is sharp. It offends me every day, and it's supposed to. It's supposed to make me less like my sinful nature and more like the Lord Jesus. And he's not done. That's just the first one. Look at the next one, the breastplate of righteousness. Ah, oh, this is the body armor. This is the halo. This is the call of duty type. Put on the body armor. The breastplate is one of the most important pieces of defensive armor because it protects the major organs. In fact, the Greek word used here is thorax. You know what that literally means? It means the heart protector. As in a, a, a calloused shield all around the heart that stops us. And Paul is telling us over in Philippians, the righteousness that we have is not from ourselves. It is from Christ. It is God's righteousness that ultimately defeats our enemy. God is perfect. He is holy. He is unblemished. He is everything that the enemy is not. Do you know the difference? Can you sense it when he's near? Without God's righteousness, we would not be forgiven. We would not be saved from ourselves. Without this central piece, we are defenseless. Then he goes on to talk about a very interesting piece that most of us overlook, especially us men, and that is the shoes. The shoes that come prepared from the gospel of peace. Shoes of the good news. See, we forget how dangerous a battlefield is because most of us don't see hand-to-hand -hand combat. But in a battlefield, if you fell down, it was a death sentence. They would have these shoes that had these lace straps that would come all the way up to their knees to give them support to where they could, they could maneuver on the battlefield. They could have metal cleats like we do today where they could adjust them to the terrain. They could walk up to 25 miles with these shoes on, and they would not slip because they had the best ones. And they knew that if they went down or their neighbor who was guarding their backside went down, it was a death sentence, and good shoes prevented that. And just like that, in our unpredictable battlefield called life, the enemy tries his best to sow as much confusion as he can, causing you to slip up, causing you to doubt, causing you to get angry with humans rather than the spirit's causing you to be 
despaired. Maybe even if all goes well according to his plans, maybe even get you to walk off the field of battle altogether. I'll tell you what, if anything has shown in this last year, there are many, many soldiers who are now missing in action. There are many soldiers who have walked off the battlefield. They have just vanished. I think the FBI would have trouble locating some of them. That's how far some of these soldiers have gone. They have gone missing. They have, they have, whether they've succumbed to fear or, or who knows what. Think about this. Our greatest aid in battle is supposed to have the peace that comes from knowing ultimately we're safe. We either believe that God holds the days of our life in our hands or we don't. Do we believe that or do we not? These are hard sayings. And Paul is saying, guys, you are safe because of God's grace. You have been adopted into his family and nothing will change that. And that is the good news of the gospel. Then he goes on to the shield of faith. Check this out. There's two types of shields used here. The first one was the one you see in most paintings and drawings, and that's the round one. This is a shield that's roughly the size of a pizza box. This is ceremonial. It was used for parades. You did not want to be caught on the battlefield with this little round circular shield, okay? Because it was, it was basically paper mache. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul is using a Greek word here called the thureon, and it is a shield that was almost the size of a door. And it was made with six layers of tightened and soaked animal skins that were so tight and so strong they could repel most arrows. And if the arrows were dipped in fire, they would be able to soak that shield and get it wet so that the arrows couldn't catch the shield on fire. It was an incredible work of, of, of engineering for that time. And when you hear the word fiery darts, most of us think darts, like we throw, I got a little, I got a little Nerf dart here that Milo shot at me, right? And we think, oh, this is intimidating, right? Pew, pew. Watch it, watch it. Pastor Bill won't even flinch. Pew. See? It does nothing. Y'all, that is not what Paul is talking about. When you hear the word fiery darts, they were deadly. And when I hear fiery darts, I go back to my childhood and I think lawn darts. Anybody remember lawn darts? Or better yet, known as lawn javelins? Oh, this is, this is, this is safe. The thing I love, I love the blue line at the bottom. An exciting outdoor game of skill for the whole family. No, it's not. It's a trip to the emergency room. Trust me. You know there's a story coming. We're out in the backyard. Lawn darts are no longer enough. So a buddy down the road brings his bow and arrow. Oh, it gets worse, much worse. Now, instead of shooting the target, we say, hey, I wonder if we could dodge this. Okay, kids, do not try this at home. I know it's fifth Sunday and all the kids are in here. We're giving our children's workers a break, a well-deserved break. Do not do as Pastor Matt did. Hear me. I didn't do it either, by the way. I was innocent of this. They decided to take them and shoot them straight up in the air and yell, scatter. Okay, now think about it. I'm going somewhere spiritual with this. On the last time, the sun is going down, it's getting dark, we lose sight of it, and I notice I'm the only one running this way, and the entire block is running this way, scattering. And then I hear people saying, Matt, no, no, it's coming right for you. Get down. Now, instinctively, I'm thinking, incoming, what do you do? You lay down, you cover it. So I lay flat on my stomach, all the way out, cover I make myself the biggest possible target I could ever make. And that arrow, as I'm coming, boom. We were done playing that game. Never play that game again. These are lawn darts, lawn javelin. When I hear the word fiery darts, I'm immediately taken back to a childhood when I did not respect what the enemy was throwing my way. These fiery darts were actually three feet of iron that they would actually hollow out and would be able to put a combustible material in it to where they could go, the shaft would splinter and this liquid would land on the person and it would catch them on fire or the shield and it would burn through things. They were so sharp and so strong and so heavy, if you didn't knock it out with your shield, it would pierce any armor. Now do you see how serious Paul's taking this? 
He's saying you must have your shield of faith. It is the only thing. Now, the other cool part that people don't realize was if you're in battle and your buddy goes down, you could summon the guy beside him to come together and your shields linked together. These giants, six foot tall, they could form an impenetrable field so that you could get up. Oh, summon a deep right here. You could get up, be helped up because you were surrounded by like-minded warriors and you could regain your feet. You could redraw your weapon. Or if you were wounded, they could carry you off to medical attention. When they put their shields together, they formed this incredible shield, this bond. Here's a picture to kind of tell you what it looked like. If you have an idea, anybody know what this is right here? Absolutely. On the next side, we got this picture, this little cute guy right here. You got it? Got the ball. Oh, look at the nails. Don't you want to trim them? Nothing can harm that armadillo when it's got its armor on. Paul uses the term thureon for a reason. How many of us even take the shield of faith when we get up in the morning? The shield of faith is one of our greatest defenses. Our enemy is constantly trying to tear this from our hands. How? By sowing fear and doubt and uncertainty. Man, if you have lived at all, especially through this past year, you know full well that life can be hard. This is why it is so huge, why Jesus says over and over, you are in this together you are supposed to gather and forsake not the gathering of like-minded believers because you are going to be, I'm warning you, increasingly an alien in this world. Jesus told us that. He flat out came out and said, guys, you know that. It's coming. You, if they had nothing better than a cross for the perfect son of God, why do we think they are going to have a bed of roses for us? They crucified him. He stood up. This is struggle. When your shield falls, when your faith becomes weak, Christians can step in and guard you and lift you up, but you have to be around other Christians. This is so, it's almost like God knew what he was doing when he left us the church. And then he goes on to give us the helmet of salvation, the best part. This is the protector of the head. See, in the battle, you can get a flesh wound. It's just a flesh wound, right? You can lose an arm. You can lose a leg if you had to, and you can hobble back to the, to the backfield and get some medical care. But you can't lose your head. It is the most important thing. And the good news is God protects the head of the believer with the one thing the enemy can do nothing about, the incredible gift of salvation. Satan cannot touch your salvation. If you are a born-again, repentant Christian, a follower of Jesus, then he has put you in the palm of the Father's hand and closed that fist around you. Nothing can take you from that. And maybe you just needed to hear that good news today. I can't think of anything more binding, more to live in chains, and to wake up today, have I been good enough to earn my salvation? I hope I kept it. That is anathema to how I read the scriptures. There is the helmet of salvation. It is the one thing the enemy can't lay a finger on. You are salvation. Church, that is awesome news. And then last but not least, Paul describes the one piece that's not only defensive but offensive. And it can protect us from the enemy's lies and attacks, and it can pierce the enemy's defenses. And that is the sword of the Spirit. I love it. God's Word right here. As we look at these swords today, the sword that Paul uses and he talks about here is called the Machaira. And it is this sturdy 19-inch long blade that is sharpened on both sides and sharpened at the tip. Okay? It is a sword that is so intense, you can actually hear it whistle when it's used properly, not like I'm doing right now. It can poke, it can slash, it can defend, it can do all these things, but guess what? It is so light that it doesn't bog you down. It is speedy. It is efficient. No wonder Paul would go on to describe this is how God's Word is, is listed as. The Word of God is living, it's active, it is sharper than any two-edged sword. See, when the Bible talks about the word, most of us think of the Greek word logos, or properly logos. But what if I told you that's not the word Paul uses here? He changes it up. Logos is that great general word. It's that Greek term that means it's the general word. It is the Bible as a whole. But in this situation, Paul chooses not to use that. He uses the word rhema. You know what rhema is? It is a specific word for a specific time given personally to help you. Think about Jesus. Do you know when Jesus used a rhema word? When Satan showed up to tempt him in the wilderness after 40 days of fasting. 
Isn't it interesting? That's when he showed up, when he thought Jesus was at his weakest. And guess what Jesus did? Every single time he brought a temptation to him, Jesus used a rhema word of scripture and quoted it back and rebuked him every single time. So let me ask this. If the Son of God himself had to rely on quoting scripture to the enemy, how much more so do you think you and I will? Are we taking our spiritual warfare that seriously? This is why we don't walk in victory, church. We don't know the authority we stand on. We don't claim that. And we're so whiny and wimpy and anemic, wondering why we don't have spiritual victory, complaining about the silliest, trivial things, when there's a world dying, desperately wanting to hear the good news, and we're the carriers of it. We have the rhema. We have a specific word. We have victory over Satan. Our sword. This is, this is God's word. It's so sad to me. So many of us leave our swords stuck in our sheath. A lot of us, we, we leave it maybe in the car, maybe stuck on a shelf all week long. It becomes dull, and rusty. Here's, here's, here's what I want to leave you with. You can't fight the enemy if you don't draw your sword. You can't do it. It'll be a, it'll be a bloodbath. I promise he will, he, he will win that battle if you go in the flesh. You can't do it. And you can't know the word if you never pick it up. Spiritual neglect. Some of us are AWOL, absent without leave when it comes to knowing this. Parents, some of us are AWOL when teaching our children about these truths. I mean, let's be real. Living for Christ today is a battle. It is tough. The culture does not want you to do it. Everything is working against you. Man, I get it. But he has saved us and empowered us, given us grace, adopted us into his family, not so we can sit on a luxury liner, but so we can be mobilized to advance the mission, to go out into the world. Our enemy isn't the people around us. It's not those who are even against us or hurt us. It is the evil that is behind this world, the one that's hiding in darkness. Do we know that? Look what 1 Peter 5, 8 says. He says, be alert. In fact, be sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. I look at this and I see these admonitions and I think it's so obvious, but when it comes to spiritual warfare, I think so many of us are anything but alert. We are anything but sober-minded about the enemy and his tactics. I think some of us, if we're honest, are more like these guys right here. This is hilarious to me, but it's so true. If you look closely, you'll see the lion over there. There's one right beside you. Wake up. Unbelievable. Even the lion's looking. Look, what's over there? I see something else. I don't, what's going on? Y'all, this is us. We're the keepers of the truth. We're the keepers of the word. We are supposed to be fearless in battle. We don't even pick up our sword. Scripture says we are in a spiritual battle. And thankfully, thank you, Lord Jesus, he gives us as followers of him tools to resist and fight the devil. Remember, spiritual battles require spiritual weapons. And if you are a believer, then you have every one of these at your disposal. Did you know that? You have every one of these. They are literally sitting in God's armory. And you can walk up. You have permission to open the vault and choose whatever you need. Because spiritual battles require spiritual weapons. Let me tell you what I mean. I'm going to share a, a powerful story about this. I'm going to go ahead and call the band up. You guys can go ahead and get in place if you want. I'm going to put a picture up of a famous, or maybe I should say infamous, French military leader. Shout out his name if you know who this is. Oh, yes. What gave it away? Was it this? The hand. What is that about? I know it must be something of the genteel class or something. He had an itch or whatever. He's got some Twinkies in there. There is this famous story that I absolutely love about Napoleon Bonaparte, okay? In his attempt to finally conquer the rest of the kingdoms of the known world, he gathered all his chiefs, all his generals, all his admirals around his military command center table, and he spread out a giant map, a map not too dissimilar from this. And as they gathered around, they were plotting commands, and they were talking and stuff, and then a hush fell over the room after Napoleon made a very 
interesting statement. He looked at his men and he said, Sirs, if it were not for this one red spot right here, I would conquer the entire world. Do you know what he was pointing to? He was pointing to this spot right here in the dead center, the British Isles. He was pointing to Great Britain. And he said, if it weren't for this, and it was marked with a red dot, if it weren't for this one red spot, I could conquer the world. What's ironic is it wasn't much longer that that one country with a coalition of others would defeat him in Waterloo. And I just imagine when Satan is strategizing with his demon lieutenants trying to conquer the world, I imagine him saying something very similar about the red hilltop of Calvary where Christ's blood was spilt. I can almost picture it. Can you? They lean in and with exasperation and defeat, tinging his voice, Satan says, if it weren't for that one red spot, I would rule the world. But guess what? There is that red spot, and it was good for us. That red spot on Calvary's Hill is what makes all the difference in our spiritual battles. It is what gives us victory. Praise God, we do not have to fear the enemy. You can walk in victory. We can enter spiritual battle armed with truth. The ultimate victory is ours because of Christ, not because of our flesh, not because we're anything good, but because he is good. We tap into that power. So you know i got to ask. Here's your challenge. Are you doing that? As we take more ground for the kingdom, as we step out, as we launch bold vision after bold vision, the enemy cannot stand it. Are you still all in? When you put your armor on and you walk out that door armed with the truth, it changes your perspective. Maybe today you need to spend a moment at the altar and say, God, I put on that piece of armor. And you put on, you name every piece and you spiritually put it on. You say, Lord, would you give me that as your adopted daughter, as your adopted son? I want to walk in victory. Sure. Maybe you want to pray for a lost family member who needs desperately to know the freeing power of the gospel. Maybe it's yourself. Maybe it's a family member that you want to intercede for. This is your time. We like to end every service we can with just a moment with you and the Lord to respond. You may want to make right where you are an altar. Maybe you want to stand and sing this final song. The altar will be open. The choice is yours. Just respond to him, okay? Let's stand together. The words will be on the screen. The altar is open. Just be obedient to what the Lord is leading you to do today.